Good evening. Um, can I welcome everyone here this evening to this uh, special meeting of Nikasa City Council and welcome also to everyone watching online. Before we formally start, uh, could I remind members to wear your mask when moving around the room? Of course, do take them off while you're uh, remaining seated. Also, the usual traffic light system which shows the time remaining for speakers is not available, as you could realize tonight. I will therefore remind um, each members when timing's running out. At the end of the meeting, could I please ask you to stay in your seats until asked to leave. Official announcement, as you know, Councillor Anita Loa very sadly passed away in July. On behalf of all members and the council staff, I would like to offer our deepest sympathies to Anita's family and friends. Anita will be a huge miss to us all and to the city. As she was appointed Sheriff and Deputy Lord Mayor at the annual meeting in May, in the near future, her name will be engraved on the banqueting hall wall. But for now, we all share a deep sense of loss at her passing. As a mark of respect, can I now ask that we all stand for a minute of silence. Thank you, Council Joseph. Take your seat. The first business of this special meeting is item one, to appoint a Sheriff and Deputy Lord Mayor for the municipal year 2021-22. I can confirm that one nomination has been received for the Sheriff and Deputy Lord Mayor for 2021-22. Can I call on Councillor Gallagher to move that Councillor Karen Robinson be elected Sheriff and Deputy Lord Mayor for the ensuing municipal year? Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It's my honour to nominate my friend, Councillor Karen Robinson, to be our new Sheriff. I know Karen's well liked across the council, so I've been trying to think of things you may not know about her. Uh, she was born in Wales End. Uh, her first job was in Wales End Sports Centre. She wasn't very sporty, but she did go on the trampolines after hours. So as you can see, it was a job with lots of ups and downs. Uh, sorry, they get worse. Uh, she worked in London for a while. She actually worked for Felix Dennis, who if you don't know, was one of the founders of Oz magazine. Uh, she was a picture editor. Uh, commissioning photos for various publications uh, and that led her to become an exhibition organiser organising events at Earl's Court in Olympia. Uh, bringing you more up the date, you may not know this but Karen's actually a qualified masseuse uh, which is amazing really when you consider politicians normally rub people up the wrong way but um, she has a 
She has a level four in sports massage. Uh, for confidentiality reasons, she won't tell me uh, if she's treated anyone famous. Uh, although I realise now, Karen, that you'll have everyone in council asking your advice on every little twinge and sprain like I did this year with my shoulder. Uh, I'm sure most of you know Karen's an actress. Uh, she's tread the boards in a number of auditoria. She's appeared in Vera, uh, local movies and commercials. However, her most enjoyable time is when she's been working with the Twisting Ducks. The Twisting Ducks is a theatre company based in Heaton that aims to give opportunities to people with autism and learning difficulties. And I know she's thoroughly enjoyed helping all these young people to learn the craft of acting and to give them confidence. Uh, Karen is a milk lady. She and her husband, Billy, own a milk round, and I declare my interest, Lord Mayor, I, I'm a customer. Um, although Billy and I had to find somewhere to hide the milk because some so-and-so kept nicking it. Uh, but I'm sure Karen goes out overnight sometimes with Billy. Uh, however, the role I know Karen is most proud of is that of being Charlie's mum. So, I've embarrassed the lad now. Uh, and this, this brings us to the reason we're here today. We know why. There have been many tributes to Anita. Um, although I'm not sure anyone mentioned what a great cake maker she was. Um, Karen was Anita's best friend. They had many, let's call them adventures. I uh, was privileged to be involved occasionally. Karen was always a great host. Uh, Karen and Edith, that would shout at us from the sidelines when we were playing cricket as part of the cricket wags, I suppose you'd call them. Uh, I remember at one, uh, one party in her house, Phil fell asleep on the settee, and I remember taking a photograph as Anita waved a chip under his nose as some kind of Phil smelling salts. And every year I send that photo to Phil, and every year he replies to me in a way I couldn't possibly repeat in full council, Lord Mayor. Uh, I know Karen's given a lot of support to Phil, Ellie and Andy in the past few months, particularly Ellie, and I know they certainly appreciate all that love and support. So I think it's entirely appropriate for Karen to pick up where Anita left off as Sheriff. And I know Karen, you'll carry Anita with you in every function you attend as Sheriff. But if I can give a little bit of advice, don't forget to put your own stamp on this office. Let your own personality shine through. We saw a bit of that last weekend at the Mela with you and the Lord Mayor on stage throwing some shapes. Uh, we can all see just from that what a great team I think you'll both be. So I have no hesitation in asking Council to elect Councillor Karen Robinson as our new Sheriff. Thank you, Councillor. Can I call on Councillor Keaton to second the nomination, please? Lord Mayor, I saw, I saw Councillor Gallagher turning it off. He didn't get away with it. Um, I just want to make two points, uh, two connected points about uh, Karen and uh, a quick word of advice. Uh, as, as everyone who knows Karen well, or has, has known her for a long time, she's got no side to her. And that's not said as a criticism, it's said as something in praise if you think about most people who you know. What she's got is a wonderful sense of humour. And anyone who's been lucky enough to uh, ever spend some time in her company will know how much she is appreciated. To get a lesson, Karen, uh, I, would, I would ask you to go back to the, the date, May the 6th, 1965, when the Sheriff of Newcastle that Councillor Theresa Russell gave a famous uh, pop singer or folk, sing, folk singer in those days, he hadn't got electric, Bob Dylan, uh, and worsted him. Uh, it's on a film called Don't Look Back. Don't Look Back. I'm turning this off. Thank you, Councillor uh, Keaton. I declare Councillor Karen Robinson to be elected Sheriff and Deputy Lord Mayor of the city uh, for the remaining municipal year. The new Sheriff and Deputy, Deputy Lord Mayor Karen Robinson will now make the declaration of acceptance of office. 
I, Karen Robinson, having been elected Sheriff and Deputy Lord Mayor for the City of Newcastle upon Tyne, hereby declare that I take the said office upon myself and will duly and faithfully fulfil the duties thereof, according to the best of my judgment and ability. I undertake to be guided by the Newcastle City Council Code of Conduct in the performance of my functions in that office. Excellent. May I be the first to congratulate uh, Councillor uh, Karen Robinson on her appointment as the Sheriff and Deputy Lord Mayor, and as has been alluded just before, uh, there's no doubt we'll make a great team, and um, I've certainly have personally experienced um, the energy you are about to bring uh, to this office, so many congratulations to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Jerry, for the kind words. I'm very flattered and slightly overwhelmed and so keen, and uh, sorry, so pleased that you kept it appropriate to the occasion. And many thanks to colleagues and friends all across the chamber. And I'm very, very lucky because I have friends from that end to that end. Um, for your support and your encouragement, and the offers of further support, which is going to be taken up on, I believe. Um, it's been very humbling. And special thanks to Wendy and Henry, my ward colleagues, who's in slipstream I ride. Last but obviously not least, my family. My husband, Billy. Parents, Joan and Tony, for their love and support. And of course, my son, Charlie, and niece, Nina, who will be taking on extra jobs around the house. You can see by their expressions that that's the first they have heard of this, obviously. And I can think you feel the enthusiasm. I don't know if you can feel it at the far end, but we can feel it here. Um, but of course, this is a bittersweet occasion. Um, whilst I'm immensely proud to be, uh, to be doing this, I'm also very, very sad. As who would have thought a couple of months ago would be, would be doing this? It's just, it's beyond. Um, I was so excited when Anita asked me to ride shotgun to her sheriff. And I can honestly say I never had this prestigious position in my sights. Anita had so many plans. And with the blessing of Phil, Andy and Ellie, I intend to carry on as many as possible. So thank you, everybody, again. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. We will now proceed with agenda item two of the special meeting. You are, uh, no, I was about to say, you, you guys are more than welcome to stay for the rest of the duration of the meeting. If you do, yeah. Make, make an escape where you can. <laughs> Continuing on the next item, it, item two, uh, the freedom of the city. Council will consider uh, recommending the freedom of the city, the highest honor that we can uh, bestow proposed by Constitution Committee. First of all, can I call on Councillor Forbes to uh, move the motion to confer the freedom of the city of Bishop Christine Hardman to be seconded by Councillor Cott. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, good evening, colleagues. And can I congratulate Karen on, you, you, on your election as sheriff? As you say, the moment is tinged with a bittersweet atmosphere, but I know that you will hold Anita's values aloft, as well as probably a gin or two in her memory. Um, 
And actually, Henry's uh, introductory speech reminded me that you and my husband actually started the massage course together. I'm very glad that you finished it, and I wish he had. Um, so I, I hope you have a wonderful year. Uh, Lord Mayor, uh, it's not often that this city meets, the city council meets to confer freedom of the city on an individual. Uh, but we have a nomination tonight in Christine Hardman, the first female bishop of Newcastle. If you were an avid reader of the Episcopal Times or the Church of England Gazette, or possibly even lesser read publications like the Northeast Evening Chron the Newcastle Evening Chronicle, uh, you can't have helped but notice that Bishop Christine announced the date of her retirement uh, last week. She's been bishop for six years, but it's a mandatory requirement in the Church of England that bishops have to retire at the age of 70. I guess there may be one or two relieved colleagues in the room that this rule doesn't apply to local government. Now, Christine has been bishop for six years in this diocese, but she's actually retired twice. She was formerly, in her previous role, the Archdeacon of Southwark, and retired with absolutely no intention of getting any further involved. But when the Church of England voted to create women bishops, she was first on the list. She was, the sec she was only the second female bishop, to be cr female bishop to be created in the Church of England. And I think we're all very proud that it was the Newcastle Diocese uh, that became her see. She has not only served the city and the wider diocese with uh, very strong pastoral care, she's got very actively involved in the life of our communities too. She's been very involved in the creation and the inclusive economy board for the North of Tyne Combined Authority and ensured that she speaks up on issues of the day and even issues which can be controversial in the Church of England. I'm particularly proud that she's championed national and international LGBT issues, for example. Uh, and because of the change in legislation when female bishops were created, she was fast-tracked into the House of Lords. And you only have to look at her record in the House of Lords to see uh, the uh, dedication and commitment that she has to this part of the world. Uh, she often raises issues in the House of Lords uh, that are affecting local residents, and it has a particular interest and concern around child poverty, with, uh, with which she's worked closely with the Northeast Child Poverty Commission. Now, that's the formal stuff about Bishop Christie, but actually, there are a couple of other things that uh, might, are worth mentioning. Um, she's probably the most likely person to win the I bet you can't guess what my job is competition, because she's probably the least like a Church of England bishop of anybody that I've ever come across. Uh, you can often find her running around the town moor, because uh, she's very uh, keen on exercise. And the last conversation I had with her, she spent a whole hour extolling the virtues of electronic bikes, uh, because she cycles every day from the uh, bishop's house to the officers in North Tyneside uh, on a, a beast of a, a bike, uh, and is evangelical uh, about promoting e-bikes to everybody. Um, so she's clearly, uh, although she's retiring now, clearly uh, got the spirit of innovation and drive uh, that represents uh, the best of Newcastle. Uh, Lord Mayor, there's so much more that I could say about Bishop Christine, um, and my only regret is that her time as bishop is being cut short by the rule in the Church of England. But I hope I've given a bit of a flavour of the way in which she's contributed to the life of the city as our bishop, and I very much hope that council will agree to confer the freedom of the city upon her. And in doing so, uh, we will be the first, she will be the first faith leader to be awarded the uh, freedom in its entire history. So I'd like to formally propose, uh, Lord Mayor, that the City Council confers honorary freedom of the city on Bishop Christine Hardman, who has served our city and the Diocese of Newcastle with great distinction and great service. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. Councillor Cott.
Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. And uh, may I also offer my congratulations to our new sheriff, Karen. Um, I hope you have a wonderful year and it brings you many blessings. I know that you're going to be uh, very important, a very important figure for residents of the city. Um, your energy and enthusiasm will, will be there, I know. Um, and I just want to say, Anita would be very proud to see you in this position. And she'd be looking down and saying, yes, Karen, you go for it, girl. So there you go. Um, I want to say a few words about uh, Bishop Christine Hardman, just building really on the issues that Councillor Forbes raised. Bishop Christine, as we've heard, was a pioneering, or is a pioneering, female bishop. She's a figure on the national stage. I think her work in the House of Lords has been very important. She's a figure on the local stage, given her work on behalf of the people in this city and also uh, in the North of Tyne area more generally. When she came into office, she was determined to see, as uh, she put it, Christians in the public square, her emphasis there, supporting the community, charitable works, and championing local needs. And Bishop Christine has supported local needs. She's been a huge support for the community, and she's been a huge advocate for social justice. We must recognize her work at the North of Tyne as chair of the Inclusive Economy Board, where she's turned her hand to addressing issues of child poverty, highlighting uh, those issues, digital exclusion and jobs, three of the most current issues that we are dealing with in society and in this city today. She's been a strong voice at the Northeast Child Poverty Commission. Child poverty is one of the scourges of modern society and there Bishop Christine has been involved in that work. Christine's work has not gone unnoticed and she leaves an important legacy as she retires. And I hope that members of council will support the freedom of the city for Bishop Christine in recognition of all that she has done. She has used her skills, her knowledge and guiding ethics to help the vulnerable and disadvantaged, and this ought to be honoured. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Codd. Does Council agree to confer the freedom of the city on uh, Bishop Christine Hardman? Thank you very much. That concludes the special meeting of the Council. We will now move on to the ordinary meeting of the Council. Agenda item one, apologies. Craig, would you read out the apologies, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor. We have apologies from councillors Ali, Avery, Beach, Cook, Donaldson, Volker, Brian Hunter, Kemp, Lawson, Middleton, Shamil Rahman, Schofield, Hazel Stevenson, Stoker Walker, and Taylor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other apologies? No, thank you. Item two, minutes. Uh, does council agree the minutes of the meeting held on 30th of June 2021 to be accurate record? Yep, thank you. Item three, official announcements. There are buckets at the entrance and at the fire exit yep, uh, of the room for members to contribute uh, a collection for Afghan refugees, information on where toiletries, etc., can be donated will be emailed again to all members and staff, including YHN and the council, uh, and in the council briefing on Friday. Item four, correspondence. Does council agree to receive the items of correspondence from Chi Onwara, the Minister of State for School Standards and the Home Office? Thank you. Item five, petitions. Uh, no petitions have been received in this month. Item six, public questions and addresses. No public questions or addresses have been received this month. 
Moving on to item seven, the recommendation of independent remuneration panel regarding amendments uh, to the City Council's Members' Allowance Scheme 2021-22. I will call on Councillor Jackie Robinson to move the report to be seconded by Councillor Durant. Jackie Robinson. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and congratulations to Karen. Okay, uh, and now formally move the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Durant to second. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Formally second and reserve for the right to speak. Just to um, offer some clarity, the report has been amended, um, the initial report, just to confirm that, okay? We do have a number of speakers on this. Can I call on Councillor Kane? Thank you, Lord Mayor, and congratulations, Chair. It took me a while to get used to that. Um, Lord Mayor, I appreciate that the Independent renew Renumeration Panel has uh, made a, a recommendation on the job description as set out for these roles, uh, but I, I can't support it because of what the Assistant Cabinet Members have already been doing. Uh, for those who don't know, they have been organising uh, ward walkabouts in certain wards uh, with senior officers. And you may ask, why is a councillor doing that rather than an officer organising it? Well, the answer is, it's very clear that Labour members of uh, split wards had plenty of prior notice of the walkabouts, so much so that they could publish a leaflet about it. Whereas, in my case in Newsburn, I was informed of this walkabout in the evening, the night before the walkabout was starting first thing in the morning. You may say that could be an oversight, but exactly the same has happened in North Jesmond with Councillor Keating, and I understand in Leamington with Councillor Smith as well. This is clearly a cheap political game. These roles are clearly created to play politics, and by paying them with taxpayers' money, we are being asked to fund silly political games on the rates, and I, for one, cannot support that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kane. Can I call on Councillor Powers? I uh, endorse the amendment that's been put forward in the report. I think, uh, despite uh, Councillor Kane's um, rant, I think it's important that us as an administration ensures that we have the correct engagement with members across the whole city, that the priorities of those members and those wards are reflected in the work that's undertaken by this administration and by the current members involved. And I welcome any move in a, in a, that is put forward by the leader or by um, the administration that helps to inf uh, further that relationship across outside of this building, across the whole of our city, and to ensure that we're effectively engaged with our communities. I think this is an important role that can help facilitate that, and therefore I, I welcome their creation, and obviously uh, any rules uh, such as these need to have a level of remuneration, and I think sensible level of remuneration that's been put forward by the independent panel. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Powers. Can I, can I invite Councillor Ferguson? Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, caught me slightly unawares there. I wasn't realising I was coming up next. Um, I'm sorry to say that I, I cannot support this proposal um, at all. I find it somewhat amazing that we actually find ourselves in this position and the um, independent um, panel has been asked to consider this. Um, what we're seeing quite fundamentally is the creeping politicisation and centralisation of what should otherwise be um, a regular part of the Council's work. 
Um, we should see all the time um, a regular engagement between the political leadership of the Council, the ward members and the day-to-day -day services um, that the Council delivers and the officers that lead them. What instead we're seeing is um, bringing in three people, um, creating jobs quite literally for the boys, um, and um, in insisting that we have to um, facilitate this process via some kind of politicised means. Um, ultimately, what we're doing here, I think, um, is replacing the valuable work of the communities team um, that did used to act as that interface between local community groups, between ward members, between the council services, um, and ultimately then through the political leadership. What we're doing is we're extending the political leadership. Um, we are centralising um, the business of the council within that political leadership. And we are saying that it is some kind of engagement mechanism, when in actual fact it couldn't be anything of the sort. Um, as Councillor Kane has noted, there are wards um, where members have been given notice quite late. Um, whenever we, um, I was informed about these so-called walkabouts, um, I very quickly got in touch to say I would love to have the chance to have a walkabout. My email hasn't even been acknowledged. The number of times I have met with the assistant cabinet member who is nominally looking at my part of the city has been precisely zero, and we are into September. So I think we need to take a serious, long, hard look at this. Um, and ask ourselves, is this really the direction that the Council wants to take to politicise this crucial role? I certainly think not. Thank, thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Can I invite Councillor Higgins? Yes, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. And uh, can I also add my congratulations to our newly elected sheriff, Councillor Robertson? Many congratulations. Um, I think in relation to this report uh, and the comments I'm hearing from the opposition, Lord Mayor, it's the kind of hidden agenda about taking the moral high ground in relation to members' expenses or members' allowances, rather. Uh, and, and, and we see it time and again, and no doubt it's probably fodder for their um, focused newsletter. Uh, but the fact is that uh, members' allowances, of course, are so that people from all sectors of society can take part in politics rather than people who are affluent enough to do so. But let me just go right down to the role itself, because in fact, in days gone by, I used to be what was called a lead member, I remember, which was probably a very similar role to cabinet members, and uh, that was quite, I thought, that was very effective at the time. And I just want to go back to um, former leader of the opposition, Councillor David Faulkner. Uh, and David was always very skeptical about cabinet style of local government and always longed to go back to service committees. And to be honest, although I felt I had to be loyal to my colleagues and vote against those proposals, I had a certain sympathy for that. And the rationale from David was that the cabinet and the leadership were too remote from the ordinary backbench members of council. And, and that created a sort of elite structure that wasn't terribly helpful and wasn't terribly healthy either. So by creating what were the lead member roles initially, and is now deputy cabinet member roles, what we're seeing now is trying to build a link between the cabinet, between the leadership, and between backbenchers. Now, you've talked there about some of the practical difficulties, and we will have that at this stage, but I'm hoping that we can have a structure here that benefits everybody across the council so that we all feel relevant in terms of the way that the council... Uh, continue, well, Councillor well, Higgins. Well, can, can, we, I, perhaps, perhaps, can we, Lord Mayor, can we be respectful know. of the speakers and those councillors who are speaking, please? Councillor Higgins, yes, continue, thanks, Lord please. Mayor. I've sat here for years and years, listening to rubbish from the other side of the, the council chamber, and I don't behave in the way that some of those members over there appear to be behaving at the moment. So all I want to say is that. As Councillor Faulkner said on many occasions, what we needed was to make backbenchers feel more relevant and more in touch with the Cabinet, and we have a structure here that's doing that. So I think it's a, I would like to thank the members of the independent, independent panel for the work they've done. I would like to recommend this report to Cabinet this evening, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. Can I invite Councillor Cott, please? Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. As you'll gather, the opposition will not be supporting this scheme, and uh, holier-than-thou justifications really will not cut any ice. I ask what the wisdom is of this approach. It sends out a message to the public that in hard times, the Cabinet's priority is to add to the burden of the public purse for political purposes. 
The paper shows that the roles of the assistant cabinet members still need to be carefully defined and their work bedded in before consideration of any additional allowances. We've heard tonight of some of the problems which really do anger me um, in the way in which the business of uh, these uh, roles has, has been uh, put forward and, and spread out so far. Any proposals that come forward need to be considered at the proper time in the round with all council allowances so that we can debate the merits of this role compared to all the other roles that councillors have. There is no need for an interim report. The interim report gives cover for what is a political priority. I see no justification for this report and I hope that it is withdrawn. One of the areas of the job description mentioned uh, is regarding uh, the role that assistant cabinet members will play in effectively communicating the top-down policies of the cabinet to ward members and to the public. That is a political role. That is political. That is politics on the rates. We need to debate the merits of that in full. This opposition believes that rather than using the assistant cabinet members to communicate to the wider public, what they should do is consider a scheme whereby we look to decentralise the decision making and funding of this council to ward members and ward committees and to give local people more say in decision making. This is fundamentally at odds with that proposal. I hope that we can debate this properly at the given time with more consideration of the key issues. This report really doesn't help us, um, and as I say, I hope it's withdrawn. I'm very much angered by the approach that's been adopted in relation to some of the wards that have been mentioned. My colleague, Councillor Kane, mentioned that he was only, only given a few hours notice effectively of a meeting. I hear of other similar experiences. This council needs to do much better for the people of this city. This is an example of where it isn't doing things right and the priorities are wrong. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Cart. Can I invite uh, those were the speakers I had on my list, therefore invite Councillor Robinson to reply. Oh, yeah, okay. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Whilst the um, members of the opposition were making all of the sounds of the barnyard animals, the administration is serious about looking at what the issues are in this city, working with members across the chamber on these issues. You mentioned the late notice, and I can apologise for that. These were done when opportunities arise and were not always um, allowed us to give longer periods of notice to members, and sometimes we are filling in cancellations as well. So I can. I understand what you're saying, but I don't apologise for that. But you're mentioning about split wards, and one of the wards mentioned we had um, a Labour member who wasn't able to attend, but the opposition member was. So I think the point you're making is, is not found. Um, and this is about working hard for all members in difficult times. If you want to talk to us about issues you're facing in your communities, this is what the rule's about. But sitting there making all the sounds of the barnyard animals is not delivering for residents, in, is just showing complete discontent for everyone in this room and the residents that we look to serve. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Can I invite Councillor Robinson to reply, please? We've had six speakers, and normal rule applies here. We can have maximum of six speakers. Councillor Robinson to reply. Sorry, uh, Councillor Durant who's going to reply. Yeah? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, with the ongoing impacts of this Tory government, cuts to council budgets means that we are forced to try new and innovative ways of functioning. 
to ensure that we are working in the most effective way possible. I believe that these assistant cabinet member roles are designed to carry out important functions to help us better connect councillors and our communities to the leadership of the council and to ensure that our community's priorities are reflected. These roles are in place to make it easier for residents to have their say um, and on the issues that will directly impact themselves and their neighbours and families. I think it's entirely appropriate for work to be correctly remunerated and that's what this independent report has told us today. So with all of that in mind, I would like to recommend the report to council and to formally second it. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Durant. Uh, does Council, sorry, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I would say that the independent panel approved numerating after a full review of the new roles and I would like to say everything you've said on that side has been duly noted and I would like to say stop being petulant. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Does Councillor agree to the report recommendation? Thank you, thank you, Councillor. I'll await legal advice. And I'll ask everyone to remain silent, please. Okay, the advice I've received. Um, there isn't any conflict of interest. It is in public domain, the cabinet members, the particular roles they are playing, and those who have inputted in this uh, debate. Sorry, say that again. I didn't quite understand what you said. Craig. It's so long as Craig heard what has been said, I'm happy with that to take those legal advice. Thank you, Councillor. Craig? Oh, okay. Councillor, could you come to the mic and put your Thank question you, precisely what you were I making. I'm asking for a ruling for Lord Mayor on whether the, 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 the decision and the, 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 uh, the, mo the motion, um, the report in front of us, involves a peculiar interest of members. Thank you very much. After seeking legal advice, I am happy um, that um, uh, those debates that's been taking place and those members who took those uh, took part in the debate um, are perfectly uh, uh, allowed and were able to. And there is no issue of conflict of interest. So therefore, we will proceed. Does council agree to the report recommendation? Okay, to vote on this, I take it, yeah? How do we vote? Your devices, have you all had plenty of practice? Get your devices out, please. Is that your device not working? You haven't got a device. Okay, just stay put, we'll come to you. Those of you who do have your devices, when you're ready, do cast your vote.
Let us just have those votes, so those members who are able to use their devices, let them cast their votes, and we will come back to those who haven't got their devices or aren't able to use those devices. Thank you. Okay, those who weren't able to use the device, was that you, Councillor Holland? Okay, can you confirm, what's your, can you confirm your vote? Yes. So that would that be a yes. Okay, who else? Yes, Councillor, your, can you confirm your vote? Speak up, Councillor. So that was a yes, okay, and who else? Anybody on this side? No. This side, yes, Councillor Keaton. That's a no, okay, and anybody else? No, okay, no, okay, and that's a no. Can we take those, those votes into consideration and retally those votes, please? Total is 37 yes, 21 no. So therefore, the recommendation has uh, been approved. Can we move on to item eight? Uh, the proposed exemption from attendance at council meeting. And can I uh, make everybody aware this is an amended version of it? Can I call on... Councillor Robinson to move the report on the amendment which has been previously been circulated. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I formally move the report for the exception and also the amended which was circulated earlier on. The amendment, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Duran to second the report. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Formally second. Thank you very much. We have no one indicating to speak to this. So does council therefore agree uh, to the report recommended as amended? Thank you very much. Moving on to item nine. Question by members. Two questions uh, marked for oral uh, reply are set out on the agenda. However, the second question relating to home office proposal to deport rough sleepers has been withdrawn as it is covered at item 16 of the agenda. Councillor Hoddard's question asks whether there are plans to convert older properties away from gas as a result of the city's target to reduce carbon emissions and achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions. I will now call call on Councillor Penny Evans uh, to respond to the question, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, Councillor Hurrah raises a really important question and I'm thankful for her for raising this. As, as many members in here at Council are aware, Newcastle has a big ambition to be net zero by 2030, and that's 20 years ahead of the government's net zero target. And that's because we recognise the urgency of doing our bit in this city to tackle the climate emergency, and we know we need to act and act now. And as Councillor Hoddart raises this question, it's important because emissions from heating in our city account for approximately a third of our carbon emissions. And that's why we have a dedicated section um, around our target and our plans in terms of our citywide residential building stock, the council's proposed approaches to decarbonisation of existing properties through retrofit programmes and increasing the standards of new homes, which are all set out in the Net Zero Action Plan. So I'm sure that Councillor Hoodart could read the Net Zero Action Plan and find out more about that. 
I mean, for example, it's really important as well because it, it, this is something that we really need government to get behind. For example, our, our housing revenue account stock, we know that it's approximately £15,000 plus per property that it would cost us to retrofit, and that's a roughly a, a cost of around £392 million. But transitioning away from gas to low carbon, zero energy, is really important because it also brings, not just about our net zero target, it brings opportunities. It brings opportunities around training for new jobs, it brings opportunities for apprenticeships, it brings opportunities for us to tackle fuel poverty in terms of um, insulating homes to reduce energy costs, and it really helps towards our green recovery. So I went just the other week to one of our pilot projects that we've got in Hillsview, where we've got 17 flats that are having um, a ground source heat pump put in. It was really amazing to see how small those heat pumps were in those properties, how the plan is to reduce the fuel costs for those young people who live there. And it was really great to talk to one of the engineers who'd started out as an apprenticeship at the age of 16 and now was leading a team, talking to me about the opportunities for green jobs and how this is the future for everyone. So I really welcome this question from Council Hoodart and we have massive ambitions, but we need to get the government to get behind these ambitions. But we'll continue to update Council on all of our um, targets and when we achieve through our net zero action plan. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Councillor Penny Evans. Uh, Councillor Hoddard, would you like to ask a supplementary? Uh, I take it that's a yes, yeah? Thank you, Lord Mayor. And can I thank Claire Penny Evans for her answer? It is an important question and I'm somebody who has a gas boiler herself. Even though it's called an eco gas boiler, in 20 years time it may not be as eco as we think. However, as a supplemental, I wanted to say that recently there were some delegated decisions made regarding the bulk procurement of gas boilers. So can I ask her that any further procurement proposals regarding energy equipment with emissions that are responsible for adding to the city's poor air quality will in future be made by the cabinet member herself and not delegated to an officer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hoddard. Thank you, Councillor Hoddard. Um, I believe that may have been to do with properties in our housing revenue account, which would actually have come under the housing property portfolio and not mine, but um, I'll certainly have a look at that. Um, it's really important in the fact that at the moment we've got so used to that instant fix of a gas boiler. We just flick that switch and we have instant hot water or we have our heating and we're so used to cooking on it as well. So we really need to be promoting the benefits of moving over towards different energy sources. But we also need to make sure that this is a just transition and this isn't about higher costs around electricity usage. So um, I think it's important for us all as members of this council to be promoting the benefits of using low carbon energy. And I hope that Council Hoodart would join me in that in promoting that, but I'll look at what the supplementary question was. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Penny Evans. Just remain there. You've got one more um, supplementary from Councillor Kane. Okay, thank you, Councillor Evans. Okay, there's um, we've, uh, three questions marked for written reply have been circulated with responses in the supplementary agenda and also published on the website. Moving on to item 10, cabinet member report, inclusive economy. Can I call on Councillor McCarthy to introduce the report? Can I remind councillors to ask 
questions on this item rather than make speeches, please. Councillor McCarty. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, and can I add my congratulations to Karen on her election as Sheriff. We look forward as a council to working with you. Um, Lord Mayor, this is very early in the municipal year for prevent presenting a report on a brand new portfolio, uh, albeit that some of the work contained in here um, has just been collected together into a new portfolio, so is ongoing work um, of the council. Uh, and uh, I think um, it speaks for itself. It, it reflects the work that has been uh, undertaken by officers on our behalf as an administration um, for this uh, for this year so far. Uh, and I don't intend to raise any issues um, within it and look forward to questions from colleagues. Um, Lord Mayor, I'd like to thank Overview and Scrutiny for their questions. Um, probing, as always, um, the, the uh, Scrutiny panel were really, really interested in the work and raised a number of issues. There were four areas I was unable to respond to at the Overview and Scrutiny meeting, and we have pulled together a note that will be circulated. We'll pass that to the Chair uh, and to the officer, uh, which will be circulated to everyone. But I just wanted to pick up um, some of those issues today in council, because I think all council will be interested in them. Um, Lord Mayor, the first area that I was asked about um, was on the Good Work Pledge, and I was asked what progress the council had been making. Uh, colleagues will be aware that the Good Work Pledge is a North of Tyne um, approach to recognizing um, uh, good quality jobs and good quality working terms and conditions. Um, I understand that um, the uh, Assistant Director for Human Resources and two officers are currently working on that at the moment. Um, I think we're probably alongside the other two local authorities who also haven't yet quite achieved the um, pledge, but we do intend to do that in the next few months. Um, Lord Mayor, Councillor Lou asked me about the um, Department for Work and Pensions um, decision that they've made nationally to stop paying pension and benefits into post office accounts. Um, I understand, I, I didn't know the impact of that, Lord Mayor, um, but there are 580,000 people who are affected across the country um, by that decision. Um, the government's contract with the post office is due to end in November this year. Um, Lord Mayor, um, colleagues will not be surprised to know that we are doing our best through active inclusion partnership, through our active inclusion team to make sure that um, residents are supported, understand the changes that are there and will support people to open bank accounts, but also um, to reduce fuel poverty, to increase their resilience um, and provide uh, and promote access to um, bank accounts. Um, Lord Mayor, Councillor Cott asked me about the um, numbers of individuals who'd secured employment following their involvement in the skills hub in the city, um, and particularly related to the Kickstart program. Um, and I mentioned in overview and scrutiny, Lord Mayor, that Kickstart um, as a scheme uh, in North of Tyne, we are going further by providing mentors to all of those young people who access the support through the Kickstart scheme. Um, so the total number of out-of-work benefit claimants um, stood at 15,500 in August 2020. It's at 13,500 by July this year. Um, that's a reduction of over 2,000, most of whom will have moved into employment. Over that same time period, 828 individuals registered with the Skills Hub service to access um, the opportunities and support through that system. Um, we are also aware, Lord Mayor, about 18 to 24 year olds who are um, significantly struggling, um, uh, you know, in terms of the opportunities. We know they've missed out through the last 18 months uh, and the unemployment in young people is falling rapidly. Um, so we do, I think, to be fair to all colleagues, we need to keep monitoring that and make sure we're doing all we can to support the young people who are affected um, by that. Um, Lord Mayor, the, the last issue that I promised to come back to overview and scrutiny about was the um, uh, research carried out by the Sutton Trust on um, uh, digital exclusion. Um, indeed, it is an interesting report, um, but it kind of confirms exactly the, uh, the work that we understand 
around the city. So the research was a snapshot around access to devices and the internet, um, and it was undertaken in March 2020 and in January 2021. Um, colleagues in education have looked at that report. Um, it reaffirms that the work that we were undertaking as a council with the support um, uh, in some cases of the government through the DfE, um, in many cases through schools, through our uh, uh, skills and uh, access to adult uh, education support, um, and indeed through the funding that was provided um, from North of Tyne in the digital inclusion um, project. So the evaluation of that, uh, the, sorry, the research looks as if we were doing the right things at the time, although clearly not fast enough and, um, and perhaps some people would have missed out on that. Um, I, I think the work that we undertook um, meant that uh, we were doing the best we could under the circumstances and, and schools were really pleased to receive that. And of course, while the DfE programme supported schools uh, and gave additional resources to schools um, for that work, we also made sure that adults who didn't have access to devices who were accessing adult education uh, and skills opportunities were also supported through that. Uh, uh, Lord Mayor, I think there is an evaluation of that programme um, underway. Um, thank you uh, to colleagues. I'm very happy to take questions um, from Council. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor McCarty. Can I invite Councillor Ashby, please? Uh, Can colleagues on that here? Do you want to come to the mic, please? Apologies, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, just as a point of personal explanation, I work for the Department of Work and Pensions, which Councillor McCarthy alluded to at the start of a speech. Though I, I don't work in the pensions section, I do need to declare that I, yeah, I do work for that department. Thank you. That's fine. Yeah. More declaration. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Like uh, Councillor Woodock, I work for the Department for Work and Pensions, but I do work for the Pension Service, so I would declare an interest. Thank you. Thank you. Any more declarations? No. Councillor Ashby. Uh, thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, and can I add my personal congratulations to Sheriff Robinson? And uh, despite your strictures on, on speeches, I shall be briefly uh, nice and thank Councillor McCarthy for a first report on this new portfolio. That cross cutting perhaps describes it well. And I'm sure she'll agree with me that Newcastle isn't just a great North City, it's a great world city. Please pass on our congratulations to Invest Newcastle for their successes over the last year despite the difficult conditions they've set themselves a high bar for next year. On the top of apprenticeships, I'm pleased to see the council has created some, but how many and how does this compare with pre-COVID performance? What sort of skills are being learnt? Does the council have a mechanism to try to transfer qualified apprenticeship, apprentices to the private sector too? Are external funding sources available for those training activities ca carried out in-house? Afghan households seeking resettlement are welcome here. Your report mentions 10 families. Is this, as it were, a government allocation or is it an offer from the City Council? Are there any constraints on receiving more? I've seen at least one person with appropriate language skills offering voluntary help. To which organisations should such people be signposted? On digital exclusion, I note useful progress reported but has any estimate been made of the potential need? And how can more be done for those for whom English is not a first language and who are not active in the workplace? If fax numbers by way of answers are not readily to hand, I'd appreciate a written update. Thank you, Councillor Ashby. Can I invite Councillor Holland to be followed by Councillor Cott? Councillor Holland. Mayor, and uh, congratulations, Karen. Unlike uh, Councillor Ashby, I, I will just ask one question. Um, 
Thanks, Joyce, for the portfolio report. It was a really interesting report to re read with lots of um, highlights and about how committed the council is in supporting and working with families and communities and certainly with people facing inequalities. It's um, certainly very, uh, I think at the moment, with the North East Poverty Commission showing that the North East has now seen the biggest increase in child poverty over the last uh, five years. I've just recently been appointed as a food champion, a rather strange title, but anyway. And so I've seen some of the fantastic partnership work that we do uh, around food poverty in the city. Could you explain a little bit more about what the council's plans are to help move people out of food poverty rather than just cope with food poverty? Thank you. Councillor Cott, to be followed by Councillor Higgins. Okay, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, Thank you much, uh, Councillor McCarty, for your report. Uh, my questions relate to the post-pandemic recovery. Um, they focus on equality of opportunity and fairness. And I also acknowledge that some of the issues relate to partnership working as well as the work of the council. So what are you doing to harness small business growth and promote creative startup businesses? That's my first question. Second one. In the recovery, how will you be looking at balancing the need to encourage investment in local communities, as well as the city centre, where much of the focus of the resources uh, in your report and elsewhere seems to be going to the city centre rather than our communities across the city? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cott. Councillor Higgins to be followed by Councillor Kane. Yes, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Uh, can I thank uh, Councillor McCarty for her, as usual, comprehensive report? Mine's a two-part question, uh, the second part of which was probably entirely predictable this evening. Uh, as a councillor representing one of the more disadvantaged wards in the city, I particularly welcome the success of the Financial Inclusion Group, as mentioned in the report. Could Councillor McCarty comment on the benefits that this provides in accessing jobs and training opportunities, particularly for the long-term unemployed. Could Councillor McCarty also comment on the economic benefits of the forthcoming Rugby League Magic Weekend to our hospitality sector so badly affected during the lockdown period? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. Councillor Kane, to be followed by Councillor Hay. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, thank you, Councillor McCarty, for the report and a rare outing for mention of cooperative councils and the Fairness Commission, so I've got a question on each. Uh, when the cooperative council policy was announced almost a decade ago, it was going to transform the way the council did business, um, but it seems, and the report seems to uh, confirm that, that it's come down to asset transfer. I was wondering if Council McCarthy could uh, expand on that and uh, tell us other examples of where the cooperative council policy has transformed services. And on the Fairness Commission principles, likewise, there's a half page here, but no mention of, of any concrete examples of where the Fairness Commission uh, has changed policy. So I was wondering if she could give some examples of where maybe the council, uh, the cabinet was going to make an unfair decision and refer to the, the Fairness Commission principles and change their minds. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kane. Councillor Hay to be followed by Councillor Abe. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Councillor McCarty, for your first report in your new role. Newcastle is a safe and welcoming city with a proud track record of helping those who need help to rebuild their lives. I'm proud that Newcastle has pledged to support a number of families who fled Afghanistan, most with nothing more than the clothes on their backs. Councillor McCarty, I was pleased to read in your report that those who settle in Newcastle will be given support to boost their language skills, to rebuild com their confidence and to release their full potential. I'm equally pleased that those who move to our city will be housed in proper long-term accommodation, ensuring they become part of our communities and offering them the independence and space they need to heal. 
With this in mind, can I ask what steps have been taken to provide long-term accommodation for those asylum seekers currently housed in hotels across Newcastle, including in the Novotel in my own ward? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ave, to be followed by Councillor Postlethwaite. Is she here? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, and congratulations, Karen. I am sure the cabinet member is working very hard to help new Afghan refugees to settle in Newcastle. Do we have the facilities to link up the new arrivals with, uh, with more established naturalized residents who in turn can use their own experiences and give practical advice to help our new residents adjust to life in the UK and Newcastle? And my second question is on universal credit. Does the cabinet member have a figure on how much of the local economy has disappeared, how much shrinkage we've had in the local GDP, Newcastle's GDP, as a result of welfare reforms by the Tory government? And do we have, can the council do anything to, to, to minimise the damages caused by the Westminster government? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ave. Councillor Postlethwaite, has she, has she just popped? out. Yeah, can we go in, in that case, can we go to Councillor Morrissey, please? Many thanks to Councillor McCarty for her report on the new portfolio. I'm particularly reassured to note she says she will work with other cabinet portfolios to ensure collaborative approaches are effective and that she will include partners from statutory and voluntary sectors. My question starts where Councillor McCarty's report finishes in that it's all about fairness. I was delighted to attend the launch of the Children and Families Newcastle last week. Geographically locating services Sorry, geographically locating services where needed is indeed good practice. And it was reassuring to hear professionals and families talking the same language, always a good sign. Providing services, links and signposting to other voluntary and community sector organisations to people who need help is vitally important. However, we are now in the early stages of COVID recovery. So, Councillor, so can Councillor McCarty tell us what the plans are for supporting families, many of whom will be losing their furlough payments shortly and who may not have had contact with services previously. And that falls into ensuring a fair share. Councillor McCarty reports highlights the fact Council is a keen advocate of the foundation or real living wage and that during commissioning and procurement, contracts are considered and markets incentivised to pay this. However, can she undertake to ensure Council all workers and employees either directly or through contracts do indeed receive this and that they don't have to work excessive hours to take home sufficient money to provide for their families? This falls into ensuring fair play. Whilst I am encouraged efforts have been redoubled to help people find work, I am concerned there is no specific mention in the creation of apprenticeships or jobs for young people with special educational needs and disabilities or our looked after children. These young people are already at a disadvantage despite having many skills and qualities which are often overlooked in the jobs market. Can I look forward to these areas being included in the next report to ensure we are offering these young people a fair go? Councillor McCarty identifies that when times are toughest, fairness is most important. To paraphrase, she says residents should feel included, are given a fair hearing and an effective voice in decision making. Can I now be confident that all residents will be consulted in a meaningful way by a variety of methods to ensure their voices are heard at a point when planning can actually be taken into consideration and so they don't feel consultation is mistaken for consent. And that would give everyone a fair say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morrissey. Councillor Postlewaite.
Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm speaking tonight in support of the amended motion. I cannot support the opposition's original... Sorry? Oh, sorry, I, got... I wasn't feeling well, so I... I... We were dealing with item 10, Cabinet Members' Report uh, from Councillor McCarty, Inclusive Economy. I was called, called back thinking it was an, on another item. I've withdrawn my question. Sorry about that. That might be the item. No problem. Take a breather. Okay, we, we haven't had any other indications, so can I invite Councillor McCarty to respond? Councillor McCarty, I'll remind you, we've spent 20.5 minutes on this, so feel free to respond to some of those questions, and if you could perhaps uh, reply, provide responses to all councillors, those you aren't able to answer tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I will do that. Um, and I may, Lord Mayor, missed noting down, I think, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, some of the opposition councillors gave me 20 questions rather than one or two. Uh, so if I miss anything out, please um, email me and I will come back to uh, colleagues with a full reply. Um, Lord Mayor, Councillor Ashby um, talked about the success of International Newcastle and I will pass that on. Um, in relation to um, apprenticeships, um, it is a fair point about working, uh, you know, encouraging opportunities with the private sector. Um, indeed, we are uh, trying to do our best across the city to bring people together to make sure that we share some of that work. Um, uh, for, for many a year, I've tried to get the um, work on apprenticeships devolved to the combined authority because I think we can do better than government could do with that resource, and it would give us additional resource to um, make sure that we can deliver what is needed here rather than what civil servants in London think we might need. Um, so I think that is work in progress. Um, I, I, I go back to my earlier point, Lord Mayor, about young people in particular have missed out over the last 18 months. They've probably missed out on those opportunities because some of those businesses weren't able to offer uh, apprenticeship support. Um, and I'm hoping that now that things are opening up, um, we can uh, rebuild that and, and give it a new kind of um, reinvigoration. Um, Lord Mayor, in my report, and, and clearly my report was produced um, for overview and scrutiny in July, so it did not take into account the situation in Afghanistan over the last 10 days. Um, what my report reflected was that we did take some of the um, Afghani um, uh, refugees who were being brought, you know, were brought through the resettlement program. So the 10 families that I refer to in my report are already settled here. Um, uh, we do work across not just um, in the council, although we clearly do have a team of officers who support uh, refugees. And I'm not thinking just in the council. Um, I'm also thinking of the support that uh, YHN offer uh, these families. Uh, but we work really, really closely with the uh, voluntary and community sector organisations. I'm thinking of West End refugees, um, you know, Northeast refugee services, or uh, who are really, really solid. And indeed, quite a lot of the um, volunteers from um, both university student unions who offer support and uh, access to language skills. Quite a lot of the Afghani families who are already settled here were translators for the British and American um, Army. Uh, and, and therefore um, already would, well, the, the uh, wage earner may have spoken English, so would have had access to that, but clearly that is part of, of what is on offer. Um, Councillor Ashby also asked me about digital inclusion need. Um, we did do an audit. Um, I'm surprised you've not seen that because I'm sure that we shared that some months ago. We did do an audit of need through education uh, survey across our families um, last summer, so in the first period of lockdown um, that did take into account the needs of um, speakers of other languages. Uh, so we did take, take that into account and actually having a device that can translate um, other languages would have helped uh, some of those children and, and young adults uh, access learning. Um, I may well have missed other, other questions from you, Robin. If, if I have, please let me know. Councillor Holland talks about the um, growth in um, children living in poverty in our city and, and I do think, uh, I, I know colleagues across the council will share our horror at the 
growth of poverty in our city when we are the fifth or sixth richest nation uh, in, in the world. Um, the council does all it can to support organizations who currently, I'm thinking of the food banks in particular, who've been uh, really active over the last 18 months, well, they've been active for some years, um, but the uh, council have brought together, council officers have brought together all of the partners to try and make sure that we're all working together because our concern is that we can't afford to duplicate the offer that's available and we also want to help people out of poverty so that they can become independent and support themselves. That, that would be um, the ideal way to work. Um, and all of the partners um, are in, you know, are working with us in order for us collectively to do that so that actually the support is broader. Uh, you know, food is a basic right of us all and it's really sad that some uh, children, some families, and you know, I hear of them regularly, I'm sure colleagues do, um, hear of them regularly who can't afford to eat themselves but feed their children and go without meals themselves and that is really, really shocking. Um, we, we are trying to work in a preventative way, um, encouraging people to come and seek support, making sure they've got the right benefits and, and the right entitlements, and quite a lot of um, benefits are not claimed, so we have a job to do really to continue um, to make sure that uh, families have got the resources that they need to support themselves. Um, Councillor Cott asked me about small business growth. Um, our uh, economic development team will support businesses of all, all sizes, you know, international, uh, sorry, the Invest Newcastle work um, is uh, excellent in terms of, it's not just about big businesses, although it's great that we can provide five or six hundred or a couple of thousand jobs uh, in the city, but we will also do all that we can to support small businesses. Um, and, uh, you know, we will do... Um, supporting entrepreneurial skills is really, really important. Individuals, you know, I think our two universities do a lot in trying to encourage that kind of entrepreneurial um, uh, work in student bodies, and all of that um, will help. Um, Councillor also asked me about investing in local communities as well as in the city centre. I think we have tried to do that. It's really tricky, though, because lots of people want to be based in the city centre. Um, I, you know, I'm thinking of the conversations that we've had around um, uh, the changes in Pilgrim Street, for example, and I know that Councillor Bell will pick this up um, uh, when he provides his report to Council. Um, but, you know, some of the um, voluntary and community sector organisations want to remain in the city centre because it's more accessible for the whole city. So it's really challenging to try and do that. But we do recognise that actually it's quite expensive to be in the city centre, so using our assets right across the city um, is part of what we will try to achieve. Um, and if you've got ideas about how we can do that, please let me know. Um, Councillor Higgins, uh, of course, talked about the rugby, uh, Lord Mayor, I think we would expect that. Um, uh, the hospitality sector has been really hit hard, hasn't it? And we know that um, they're not, they've not actually been able to recruit, although that is, you know, and I'm thinking of the jobs and training opportunities um, uh, that Councillor Higgins mentions. So, you know, our financial inclusion group has brought people together to talk about what we can do collectively. Um, I, I think the active inclusion team are really successful. Our work on prevention is really good. It requires people to come and ask for that support. But once you come and ask for that support, you'll be given every opportunity um, to access the jobs, training opportunities um, that are available. And of course, we can't magic work out of nowhere. But um, it, it's that coordination and that partnership working, I think, which is a strength of our work on active inclusion. Um, Councillor Kane asks about co-op council and transforming the way we do business. Asset transfer was one example because the um, cooperative council's um, innovation network recently launched that report and, and the leader of council uh, wrote a forward for that uh, on our behalf. Um, that is one example of the work that we have done. Uh, there are many. We have just sent in two more reports, one's about the community forest, because actually, being a, being a, there's no such thing really. We can't be a cooperative council. We're part of a network of councils that are trying to uh, work in a cooperative way. Um, 
but the values that we demonstrate on things like that, well, even in our financial inclusion group, bringing partners together is cooperative ways of working. Um, and I'm really proud of what we um, achieve through that. I think the community forest is a really good idea. That's not just us as a council, that's working with neighboring uh, local authorities to achieve that. Our work on food is another really good example of where we're trying to work using those values to uh, inform us to use the evidence that we've got and work um, in, in that kind of cooperative way. Um, we've got, uh, we're launching a really simple way of understanding those values um, very soon. Uh, and I think they're really helpful in understanding um, how we can demonstrate that we're achieving those values. Um, Councillor Kane also asked about the Fairness Commission and how we have changed policies on the back of that. Um, the Fairness Commission approach has been um, well demonstrated through the budget process and that's probably the example that I would give uh, because I think that's where it is strongest because it's when we look at budget decisions that we um, explore the um, Fairness Commission outcomes and look at that and make sure that no one is being um, unfairly treated. Uh, so we wouldn't make an unfair decision because we would know that that was what would, we would, you know, that was be flagged in that uh, report, in those um, impact assessments, uh, the integrated impact assessments where it's really clear uh, and, and therefore that decision would be um, mitigated if it was uh, thought to be unfair on a particular sector of our community. Councillor McCarthy, can I remind you, we've spent uh, 31 minutes coming. You to want be me to fair, wind up quickly? You've had a lot of Lord questions. So I'll be re I, yes, thank pick you. Pick one and uh, respond to them afterwards. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. Um, maybe, Lord Mayor, if, if you'd like me to, I'll stop there and I'll respond to others separately if that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Um, maybe a reminder to uh, all councillors, be very concise and precise with your questions we could perhaps get complete the rest of the agenda of the evening moving on item uh, sorry does the council agree to receive this uh, report thank you very much moving on to item 11 appointments are the appointments agreed as set out Thank you. Item 12, notice of motion, environmental standards across the city. Uh, can I call on Councillor Donnelly to move this motion and to be seconded by Councillor Smith. Councillor Donnelly. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Firstly, can I say to Karen, congratulations on your appointment as Sheriff, and I hope that, like the current Lord Mayor, you're as good a dancer as what he is. Right, Lord Mayor, the motion addresses residents' views across this city. Many in this chamber will remember the resources that each ward in the city had. It is worth remembering that both administrations of Labour and the Lib Dems help to deliver clean, safe and well-maintained neighbourhoods equally, regardless of a ward being affluent or deprived. Nobody can deny the challenges that this council faced during the onset of austerity. However, some of the decisions have and continue to cause greater long-term problems. We just have to look at the reduction of the tree inspectors across this city. This led to a substantial backlog of work. Whilst we all accept this has currently been addressed and new staff have been employed, there is still inevitably that backlog. The same can be said for frontline services. The cuts were front-loaded. Temporary staff have now become permanent and the resource the city now has is slightly greater than before. But we are still trying to catch up, Lord Mayor with less staff and more work. In the increasing challenges of the seasons, the British weather. This year has been particularly problematic with weed growth. In many parts of the city, thistles have been as high as children. Shrub growth, overhanging trees, has become a problem on footpaths and roads. We can and must 
do better. And the problem that we have is that residents are seeing this very much as a north-north divide where our neighbouring local authorities are offering better frontline services. Why? Because they have more staff. Lord Mayor, it must be said that our staff and management are doing a tremendous job with the limited resources that they have. But we are too often reliant on weather conditions which are out of our control. We cut grass less than all of our neighbouring councils. We stream less we often have limited, if any at all, beautification across the city. We rarely, in a lot of wards, litter pick. And this has been solely left to the many volunteers across this city. A huge difference from neighbouring councils. Lord Mayor, this motion asks the council to look again at funding services equally across all 26 wards. Building on the past, except that the council has pulled power away from councillors and residents through the Envirocall system, which in this very chamber has been criticised by councillors, residents and former cabinet members. This council had a good record and we can return back to those days, albeit in the world of financial constraints. It is not sustainable to continue in the way we are. We are firefighting rather than moving forward and to deliver on the council's own ambitions to create safer, cleaner and greener neighbourhoods, we need to work together to make the necessary improvements which this motion asks for. Lord Mayor, to end, we have spent considerable money on campaigns to stop littering across this city. But unfortunately, what we need is staff on the ground. A resource fairly spread out across Newcastle in each ward. We also must and need to look at the effects of climate change, which is going to have on the grounds maintenance programme. Weather such as warmer winters and the seasons inevitably always changing means that this equates to more growth and required maintenance. Lord Mayor, I hope that we can support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Smith to second the motion. I second the motion, Lord Mayor, and reserve the right to speak. Thank you very much. Can I invite Councillor Bell? Councillor Bell? Thank you, Lord Mayor, and congratulations on your appointment, Sheriff. Members will be aware of the decade of deep and damaging budget cuts we have had to, we have had to make because of government's austerity and the visible impacts this has had on local neighbourhoods across the city. I agree fully that all council staff should be praised, and I don't think there was enough praise that came across in that speech, for their efforts, those that kept essential services operating throughout the pandemic and particularly those that have continued to maintain clean, green and safe communities throughout the year of austerities when frontline cleansing and grounds maintenance staff numbers have been reduced significantly. I am sure all members will agree that when it comes to neighbourhoods, not one size fits all. Since 2017-18, we have been investing back into frontline operational services. This has included temporary one-off monies the most significant of which includes one-off airport dividend funding, and since 2021, around £1 million permanent additional budget. This has been used to for employ additional staff and purchase additional equipment and vehicles. The current neighbourhood offer is made up of operational teams managed east and west within wards and in the city centre. We have created rapid response teams to deep clean known hotspots support the removal of fly tipping and action quicker responses when requested. We have increased the mechanical sweeping and grass cutting resources to improve cleaner, greener streets and ensure the grass cutting program of eight cuts per year is completed. We have set up streaming teams to respond to ad hoc streaming requests and traffic island team to continue the clean up of crossings and traffic islands. We have also funded the traffic management measures 
that need to be in place will ensure staff safety on main arterial routes and faster sections of the transport network. We have introduced and revised a set of local operational service standards so that residents and members know what levels of response time they can expect the issues. We have embraced technology to improve efficiency and do more with less. We have introduced large litter bins and large litter bin sensors so that the city overall has more litter bin capacity where bins are emptied when full as the sensor indicates, freeing stuff to reduce uh, and resources to other work and reducing the carbon footprint. We have refreshed our website pages and introduced online fo forms to make it easier for residents and ward members to highlight issues of concern. Our mechanical sweeping fleet have efficiently planned routes using in-cab technologies which can evidence when they have been in streets across the city and we are looking to introduce similar systems with our grass cutting fleet to improve the service delivered. All that said, we agree that there is much more that can be done to improve local neighbourhoods. Climate change is most certainly contributing to rapid grass growth and overpopulation of weeds. Projected household growth of approximately 1,000 properties each year until 2030, increasing further neighbourhood service demands. The leader, deputy leader and I have been and will continue to be out and about in neighbourhoods, listening to what residents and members said was important. In conclusion, I can advise that we are fully committed to looking at the feasibility of increased neighbourhoods resources as part of the next council budget. This will enable us to proce uh, a process of consultation on the difficult decisions we would have to make in order to do this. Lord Mayor, finally in closing, I ask members to note the efforts that I've listed. I also ask members to support all of the efforts that our staff have put into keeping this a clean, green city. And I also ask members to vote against this blatant example of election yearning. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Hall to be followed by Councillor Hay. Councillor Hall. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Council, uh, Councillor Bell mentioned their expanded litter bin capacity. Um, the only thing that seems to have increased is how often the bins are overflowing. Um, I hate to retread old ground, but the issues with local services raised in this motion are directly impacted by the earlier decision this evening to feather the labour nest. Bringing cabinet closer to the people, improving access for backbench members, just like the old multi-party committee structure, utter rot. If Labour were serious about these goals, then they would be using what we all know works. Proper funding of our excellent communities team, and just in case you've missed that, excellent communities team, because the officers do a miraculous job with what they are given in funding. This would allow dedicated non-political officers to focus on one ward and form that critical link between residents, councillors and the council itself. Instead, we are presented with a further expansion of the cabinet and erecting further political barriers to proper accountability. This motion is a key issue in this city, or goes to a key issue in this city, the blind centralization of control and distancing of accountability. Residents can no longer speak to someone in person at the contact center, but contact the faceless Envirocall service with very mixed results. If residents come to local councillors with issues, which we wish to take action on, we must now apparently supplicate ourselves to an expanded cabinet, with residence issues presumably filtered and prioritised as they see fit. If there are important developments in our ward, residents and councillors are contracted, contacted as they see fit. For all Labour's complaints about lack of funding and hard times, they have managed to spend half a billion pounds in capital investment in the last half decade. The overwhelming majority of that has gone to the city centre in projects like Central Station, Stevenson Quarter, Civic Centre, Pilgrim Street and many others. We have asked multiple times for council to use some of that investment money to meaningfully deal with the £180 million backlog in road maintenance, yet barely a drop has been used. The council is happy to change Haymarket Junction three different times but won't resurface the street outside your house. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hall.
Councillor Hay to be followed by Councillor Cott. Councillor Hay. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, in his motion, Councillor Donnelly makes a fleeting reference to austerity, blink and he admits it. But there's no acknowledgement of the scale of the challenges we face as a council since 2010. 305 million pounds slashed from our budget, an increase in demand for our adult and children's social care services, the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, all have an, input, an impact. Our teams, those responsible for operational issues, are expected to deliver far more with far less, and they should be applauded for that sterling work. I agree with Councillor Bell. There's no doubt what people see as they walk out of their front doors matters. Neighbourhood issues are hugely important. They matter to us on this side of the chamber, as demonstrated by the leader's decision to appoint a team of assistant cabinet members to engage with ward members to ensure that community priorities are reflected in the work of the cabinet. And I, um, I will take this opportunity to follow Councillor Stone's advice and to declare an interest as one of the three assistant cabinet members. However, we have to be practical and we have to recognise that we simply don't have the resources that we had in 2003. We need to develop new and innovative ways to tackle neighbourhood issues and concerns within the budget we have available to us. It can be done, it will be done, because our residents deserve it, but we can't vote up this, amendment through, uh, this motion through. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hay. Councillor Cott, to be followed by Councillor Robinson. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. This is a very difficult issue in many senses because there are, of course, great constraints on council budgets. And, of course, as an opposition, we recognise the difficulties uh, that the administration has. We also recognise the, uh, the commitment of our staff and the sterling work that they do and go beyond uh, the minimum requirements in many ways, day after day, because, of course, they are very committed to this city. However, it is the case, as we've said many times in this chamber, and I think this debate in many senses revisits previous ground, some of the choices that are made are choices that have been made by this administration. This opposition has come up with a number of amendments over the years since that austerity, as the administration keep referring to, um, explaining how we could do things differently. And yet, we come back with this reply of rhetoric, can't be done because of the Lib Dems in the coalition. All of that is entirely a load of nonsense, as we know. It's a way of blaming others for incapability of making decisions. On a daily basis, on a regular basis, I'm sure all of us in this chamber get so many inquiries from residents around litter, fly tipping, broken roads and pavements, graffiti, uh, maintaining trees and shrubs, antisocial behaviour, difficulties with Envirocall, difficulties in contacting the council. And uh, Councillor Bell comes forward with some very valid perspectives on how the council is trying to deal with those things. But these are all process issues. They're all management issues. They aren't political. We need to make a political decision, a political decision to structure the way in which the council does its business better. I've said earlier in this, uh, sorry, earlier in this uh, meeting that we want to see more fundamental decentralization of decision-making to wards. We think that neighborhood services should be more responsive to local needs. Over the years, I have seen so much resource taken out of our local wards, centralized and then redistributed in a way which isn't responsive to local needs on the basis of the fact that it's the Liberal Democrats' fault because of austerity. This has got to stop. We've got to move forward. You've got to move away from talking about austerity and talk about the issues that really are important to people on the doorstep, right? There is a by-election going on at the moment, as you will realize. 
And many of you will have heard some very unkind things, probably, about the way in which the council is doing its business. And I hope you're taking note of some of those things, because those things are replicated right across the city. Lord Mayor, the opposition will support this amendment because I think it's about time that the council starts to reevaluate re its approach. It engaged more with local communities, looked at new structures to enable more decision making at a local level, give local ward members more power, and make the decisions about neighbourhood services more accountable to local people. When we do that, we will have a much better council, and it will be one which will uh, resonate. Uh, with the perspectives of our residents. If we don't do that, we'll be continue to seen, be seen as remote. The opposition recognise this, and we will do things better. I hope the administration will take note. Thank you, Councillor Cott. Can I invite Councillor Robinson, please? And just to uh, clarify, Councillor Cott, I haven't seen an amendment. It is the motion you were referring to. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Donnelly mentions equal funding for wards, whether affluent or deprived. It should be noted wards suffering deprivation were awarded increased funding under a Labour government. Lord Mayor, this is typical of councillors independent councillors who will not condemn the Tory government for the 305 million worth of cuts since 2010 and the impact it has had on our services, plus we are coming out of a pandemic. Councillor Donnelly states council should look at ways of funding the service across 26 wards. Yet, there is Councillor no Robinson, reason. can colleagues on the left hear? Perhaps if you could come close to the mic. Just continue where you left from. There's books on there. <laughs> There's books on there. Would you like me to start from the beginning? Just continue where you left off, please. <laughs> okay. I'll go from. Council Donny will not condemn the Tory government for the £305 million worth of cuts since 2010 and the impact it has had on services. Plus, we are coming out of a pandemic. Councillor Donnelly states council should look at ways of funding a service across 26 wards, yet there is no costings of how this would be achieved. Lord Mayor, a lot of the issues in this motion are operational. It's the role of council and councillors to set policy, not get involved in the structure and management of delivery. Measures are being implemented by the Labour Administration to increase communication and engagement which will help neighbourhood services. These include assistant cabinet members, leaders and directors walkabouts. Lord Mayor, Councillor Donnelly has had many budget alternatives. He has presented to has he presented any to this council during his years in office? No, he hasn't done none. I will not support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Now, I will take uh, one more speaker, although I've had a list for more. So the permitted is a total number of six. So therefore, final speaker, Councillor Lovat. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and congratulations to Karen in her role as Sheriff. I regularly drive into Newcastle City Council area and consider to myself I don't need to know where I've crossed the border, I can visibly see it. As councillors, we persist to deal with graffiti, damaged footpaths and roads, overgrown trees and bushes, weeds in the pavements, overflowing litter bins, etc. Staff are doing their best job they can with the resources available, I applaud them. But the Labour group continue to make excuses and blame cutbacks and austerity as a reason for being unable to provide the services which are required by residents. We must remember that the Labour administration set the budget, the priorities and the maintenance strategy. The strategy they've chosen to implement drives a reactive culture 
one which is highly costly and, as witnessed daily by residents, is inefficient, providing a low standard of service. Councillors should be aware that this strategy is likely to increase the likelihood of incidents and accidents within our workforce. The Labour Group cannot continue to blame austerity and cutbacks. They set the budget, they identify the priorities, and they are not delivering for residents. This service needs to be reviewed and improved to give our officers the resources they need to provide an effective service. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lovart. Councillor Smith, you reserve the right to speak. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and congratulations to Karen on her election as Sheriff. Um, Lord Mayor, Councillor Donnelly paid tribute to frontline staff and recognised the financial ch challenges this council has faced, and I echo his comments. Councillor Donnelly also talked about neighbouring councils um, and how they have managed to maintain standards. Last week, Lord Mayor, I managed to grab a few days away to air. The first thing my wife said when we arrived home was how dreadful Newcastle looked compared to all the areas we had travelled through. Air has meadows, it has areas uh, that have been allowed to grow wild, but not the seas of weeds that Newcastle has, but then calls, then calls them meadows. It doesn't have bridle paths that are unpassable because the nettles have encroached so far onto the path and become taller than children. Air has areas that are a little overgrown, but not weeds growing up street signs and bins and growing out of curbs and cracks in the road. In air, the street signs are visible, while too many streets and signs in my ward um, are cracked, rusted and faded. Next time the leader comes to Levington, perhaps we can sing a well-known U2 song on his post-walkabout video. Many of the newer members may not remember neighbourhood response managers. These were roles that Newcastle had before we started farming nettles. The neighbourhood response managers took a pride in the areas they covered and made sure problems were tackled. They were the face of the council and they were able to find local solutions to local problems uh, and they were more accountable than the system we have now. Since being elected and indeed before, I have raised numerous issues through EnviroCall and the local services system. Unfortunately, my experience of this face faceless system can only be described as variable, um, and many of the issues I have raised have been actioned quickly, but many others are bounced back with no resolution or take ages to respond. Under the current system, we have half a roundabout cut back and half completely overgrown. Is this what Councillor Bell says when he says one size does not fit all? Sometimes it seems that the local services system is designed not to sort some types of problems rather than actually do something about them. Lord Mayor, at the heart of this motion is fairness. People in all wards are contribution to the taxes we take but not getting the same le levels of service. This needs to change and I urge, urge councillors to support the motion. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, councillor. Before Councillor Donnelly exercises his right to reply, I'd like to raise the fact that he's still not apologised to our good friend and colleague, Councillor Hazel Stevenson, nor to the Office of Lord Mayor of this city. Um, can he be asked to do that and obviously invite him the opportunity if he responds to the, um, the motion? Thank you, Lord Mayor. That's not, not part of uh, the business of this evening's meeting. Thank you for clarifying that. Councillor Smith, we believe this was your maiden speech. Well done. Can I invite Councillor Donnelly to reply? Thank you, Lord Mayor. 
Listening to the comments this evening, the issue affects all wards, which is obvious. Recently looking at Facebook, uh, you can see Councillor Higgins taking up part of his ward. And he stated, guess what, somewhere on the schedule, the work to be done. This sentiment echoes the comments by many residents throughout the city. It's always somewhere on that list. To answer the points which have been raised, I'm, ha I'm happy, more than happy to condemn the government cuts. With regards to the feasibility study, which Councillor Bell stated, I welcome that and look forward to more information coming forward uh, before the next budget. Tonight, we've empowered some individuals and they are councillors. We say we've got no money, but unfortunately we've just paid three deputy cabinet members. With regards to the city, we talk very much of the city centre policy first. And unfortunately, in the likes of my area, which is the outer west, it seems to be the forgotten place. Recently, in a letter which I sent to the leader of council, which you would have seen, the outer west customer service centre, which obviously on record everybody knows is shut, the housing office is shut, outside of that customer service centre is weeds, nettles on the approach, furthermore there was a rat, which I reported to the leader of council, unfortunately I never got that on um, the camera at the time, disgraceful. Next to that is the outer west pool, closed. Uh, and at the same time, all of this was just surrounded by nettles. It's yet to be cleaned up. This is months since it was initially reported. Um, all of the North East Councils have had cuts. Um, the Mayor of North Tyneside, Norma Redfern, which I've said on many occasions, and I would like it to be on record, she does a fantastic job. Um, her authority is, is immaculate, and certainly frontline services are excellent. Equally, Northumberland County Council do a very good job. Um, with regard to the budget, I was criticised for never putting alternatives forward. Well, to answer that point, unfortunately, it's simply because I've never had anybody to second um, my motions or <laughs> alternatives to the budget. So, Lord Mayor, we have a motion tonight. It's looking to firstly praise the staff. I said that at the, at the onset of my um, address. Secondly, to look at equal services across all 26 wards of this city and to accept and to acknowledge residents' concerns across this city that they are not happy at all with the current standard to which this council is delivering. Why? Because we haven't got enough staff. Why? Because we cut them too heavily. What's the alternative? Increase the staff and deliver the services equally, regardless of where you live. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I hope this motion can be supported. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. I get the impression we will require a vote on this motion. On your devices, please. Let's deal with those who will... You would like a name vote? Is there... So, we... is there 10 people to enact this? Okay. That's 10 or more than 10. I cannot count. Get on your devices, please. Let's deal with those who can access your devices, then we'll deal with those of you who either haven't got it or unable to access it. anyone who is not able to access the device one two three can you confirm your vote yes or no that's a no that's a two no that's a three no was there anybody else yes. that was a yes from you so there's three uh, councillors on the left-hand side who couldn't access their uh, devices voting yes, and there's three on this side who couldn't access voting yes. What does that do to the magic number? So, sorry, no here, yes there. Yeah, I think I knew what I was doing. Not necessarily saying. So, uh, 
yes is 19 and no is 38. So therefore, that motion is uh, no. Moving on to item 13, uh, notice of motion failing Afghan people. Can I call on Councillor Ashby to move that motion to be seconded by Councillor Kilgawa? Hello, Mayor. Uh, I'm delighted that this is a cross-party motion and that Councillor Karen Kilgour, who is also the City Council's Armed Forces Champion, will second it. This sends a very important message to our armed forces, veterans and the Afghan people we are welcoming. And that inclu I include with that the collection that you've agreed to be made tonight for refugees. Lord Mayor, 457 British soldiers died in Afghanistan. Our soldiers went to do the bidding of our government, of the governments of all parties, and did their job with courage. Thousands came back with life-changing physical or mental injuries. We thank them for their service and sacrifice, but we owe them a debt that which goes beyond a thank you and a disability pension. Reading the obituaries is heart-rending. Newcastle-born sapper Adam Murrelly of the Royal Engineers, Moser or massive to his mates, died on the 5th of March 2014 in Helmand. At the time, they said that his love for Newcastle United was only rivalled by his love for his fiancée, Emma, and parents, Lynn and David. Lisa McKinley said to her husband, JJ, of the Rifles, he was a true friend to others and a loving husband, a real joker, and my one in a million. The commanding officer of Lance Corporal Carl Marshall of Tupara, who attended Churchill Community College, said, he was a charismatic, upbeat Geordie, ice cool under fire, and a natural leader always. He was ever optimistic, even in the bleakest of circumstances. He is irreplaceable. Corporal Steve Dunn, who attended St Joseph's School Heaven, was a loving husband to Cheryl, a son to Vicky, and a doting dad to Emily. His commanders and comrades said, Corporal Dunn epitomised all that's best in our soldiers and all that's best about Newcastle and the North East. At every turn, he strove to improve the lot of his men. He tackled his work with a sense of purpose and in pursuit of making a difference. It was his third tour of Afghanistan. Did all this loss and the tears make a difference? With half the population of Afghanistan under the age of 18, who have only known the freedoms and opportunities our present brought, we must hope against hope that it did. Religion enforced with a swish of a cane or the threat of a gun rather than freedom of conscience is disguised tyranny. Half the population of the country has been banished from the streets and consigned to the role of baby factory. A female reporter now hiding said, there's no space left at all for working women in Afghanistan. The music is dying. Singer Farwad Andarabi has been dragged from his home in Kandahar and shot in the head. The motion states, that need, not numbers, should govern our, gov govern our government's policies. It's a matter of some small satisfaction that over 15,000 civilians have been flown out of Kabul by the RAF. 2,200 of them are children, including one <coughs> who's only one day old. Many of them are from the group to whom we owe the biggest debt of honour, interpreters who are side by side with our troops as they sought to make a difference by engaging with ordinary Afghans. First reports were that they'd been cast adrift. This is dishonorable conduct by Her Majesty's government. And a very large number of others have been left behind too, including British passport holders or their dependents. British citizens, London shopkeeper Musa Papa'ol, his 14-year-old grandson, and farmer taxi driver Mohammed Niazi were killed by the Daesh suicide murderers at the Kabul airport. Despite the good job done by our forces, amongst the questions the Foreign Secretary must answer is, why were these British passport holders not given priority safe passage onto the airport, and what is the government going to do to help their dependents, still in Afghanistan, to safety? There are already Afghanis in camps in countries surrounding Afghanistan. There will be more. We must help. There is a precedent. Not every Afghani will want to leave their part of the world, just as Syrians fleeing Assad's regime don't want to. 
the UK has spent £3.6 billion in the Middle East over the last 10 years, including £820 million in Lebanon, where around a quarter of the population are refugees. We spent over three quarters of a billion in Jordan on humanitarian aid, supporting job creation and helping that country to build longer term stability. Refugees making a new life in the region are less likely to try to come across the channel in a rubber boat in despair. The government must promptly reverse the cuts in foreign aid and particularly help Pakistan to where over a million people in this country trace their roots. Difficult though it may be, we must also help the large number of Farsi-speaking Afghans who have or will flee into Iran and those who go north. At the 31st of March this year, over 3,000 Afghans whose land of origin was, has lurched back two decades in a few days were waiting for a decision on their applications for settlement here in the UK. That bureaucracy must be expedited too. Lord Mayor, I move the motion and look forward to listening to contributions which will cover matters which I don't have time to mention. Thank you, Councillor Ashby. <laughs> Councillor Kilgawa to second the motion. And congratulations, Sheriff, on your appointment. And thank you, Councillor Ashby, for bringing this motion tonight and for offering to make it a cross-party motion. We may have our political differences, but it's good to see us united in this hall tonight to express our solidarity with the Afghan people and to call on government to offer sanctuary in the UK to those fleeing the Taliban. Thank you also, Robin, for a very moving speech. I have a family member who served in Afghanistan and I'd like to echo your thanks to him, to those who served alongside him and their families for their courage and for their sacrifices. Lord Mayor, the government have many questions to answer over their handling of the withdrawal from Afghanistan and its aftermath. Why have so many people, including British nationals, been left behind? How can they hope to help Afghans fleeing the country without a presence there, diplomatic or otherwise? Why were documents containing details of Afghans working for um, the U or, or with the UK left in the British Embassy? And of course, why did the Foreign Secretary think it more important to finish his holiday than to deal with a growing crisis? This ineptitude has a human cost. The impact of Taliban rule will be felt by every Afghan citizen, but most definitely by women and girls and the LGBT plus community. I read an account only this morning of a young woman instructed to leave her job, who had burned her jeans and donned a burqa, bought for her by her brother, since she's no longer safe to leave her home, not through any choice, but because she fears for her life if she doesn't comply. Councillor Ashby has given us other very stark examples. I'm proud to say, however, that since 2014, Newcastle has offered homes to Afghan staff who worked alongside the British Army. To date, we've resettled 38 households under this scheme. More recently, we've committed to support Afghan families under the new Afghan relocation and assistance policy, recognising the risk posed to these staff due to their work with the UK government. To date, five families have arrived under these arrangements, with another five due to arrive over the next few weeks. However, we await details of the government's plan for the Afghan citizens' relocation scheme for refugees fleeing the Taliban. As yet, there are no details of how the scheme will operate, nor when it will begin. And for those who would have us believe it's a choice between helping our veterans or helping asylum seekers, or between those born in Newcastle or those who hope against hope to be offered sanctuary here, you're wrong. We're one of the richest countries on the planet. We don't have to choose between. If we choose to, we can do both. If the government can grant friends and party donors billions of pounds of PPE contracts, then it can fund councils and our partners to house Afghan families and provide the wraparound support and care needed by people forced to leave everything behind and to help them integrate and contribute to their new communities in a way that doesn't put additional pressures on public services. The UK must also offer protection to people left behind in Afghanistan. But it's important that we do that in addition to respecting the Refugee Convention and the right of refugees to seek asylum protection if they arrive in the UK independently, 
something that the Nationality and Borders Bill puts at risk. I believe the UK has a moral obligation to the Afghan people. We stand ready as a proud city of sanctuary to play our part and we call on government to honour theirs. I'm very proud to second the motion, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kilgour. Councillor Shatwell. Would it be in order, Lord Mayor, to have a minute's silence in um, memory of the servicemen and women who have lost their lives in Afghanistan and in solidarity for the Afghan people? Can I invite Councillor uh, Shatwell? Thank you for uh, raising that up. Can I invite Councillor Shatwell? We welcome back to that. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Ashby, for this motion. Our governments have failed the Afghan people time and time again over the past 20 years, and today we continue to fail them through the Tory government's barbaric attitude to refugees. This Tory government have also failed the people of Newcastle. On Saturday, the Newcastle Central MP, Chion Wurra, had the unenviable task of writing to residents, telling them that there's now little chance of their families being evacuated from Afghanistan nor is there a clear plan of what their options are in the coming weeks and months. Despite this, the Tories claim that their Afghan refugee scheme is one of the most generous in our history, clearly forgetting that since 2008, we repatriated three times more refugees to Afghanistan than we planned to welcome this year. Having a fixed refugee quota is absolutely futile in such an emergency, and the reasons given by Priti Patel that it's not possible to take any more has no grounding in reality. In fact, only a small number of Afghan refugees actually come to Europe. More than 80% are in Iran and Pakistan, amounting to nearly 5 million. Compare this with 450 successful British asylum applications from Afghans last year. The idea that Europe bears the greatest burden in welcoming refugees is a myth spread by the UK government and also the EU. This week, EU members stated their determination to prevent uncontrolled migration from Afghanistan. This is despite the UN Refugee Agency calling for borders to remain open and for more countries to share responsibility with Iran and Pakistan. This so-called generous Afghan resettlement scheme should be seen in the context of the Tories' regressive Nationality and Borders Bill. The bill treats refugees differently depending on how they arrived here, criminalising those without proper papers, which are impossible to get when you're fleeing war and oppression. The other toxic immigration myth is that the British public are against it. However, the majority think we could do more to help Afghan refugees, confirmed by all of the generous donations and volunteers we've seen in Newcastle. People are decent and compassionate and do actually care in contrast to the Tories. People care because they can see that refugees are people like us and the way they're treated reflects on how we're all treated. A fraction of the money spent on war could house, feed and educate refugees. We have failed the Afghan people because the war on terror doesn't work. Peace and democracy can only be achieved by political struggle within a society, not by bombing and invasion. As Biden, as Biden himself said, the events we're seeing now are sadly proof that no amount of military force would ever deliver a stable, united and secure Afghanistan. We need to welcome refugees without quota or prejudice and put an end to these disastrous wars by putting solidarity and compassion cooperation and diplomacy at the center of our foreign policies. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shatwell. Can I invite Councillor Ali Aver, please, to be followed by Councillor Frew. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Withdrawal of foreign troops is normally a cause for celebration for the invaded country. You expect the people to be pleased to have the sovereignty and power of self-determination back. But as we have all seen from the images of desperate people in Kabul and the rest of the country, 
Sadly, that hasn't been the case for the people of Afghanistan. The abrupt withdrawal of international troops from Afghanistan has not been a cause for celebration for many Afghans because they see themselves no better off than 20 years ago, despite all the sacrifices they have made for their homeland. Full control of Afghanistan by Taliban extremists will make life miserable for those in Afghanistan and unavoidably 5 million Afghans who live in neighboring Pakistan and Iran. Regardless of the differences that the UK government has with the regional players, we must encourage these countries to help us. We should not let the strained relations with some of Afghanistan neighbors deter us, from ask, deter us from asking for their help to get our people home safely. Many Afghan interpreters and other sports staff have fought and worked with us, and they certainly deserve to live with us. I am proud that I'm proud that as a city of sanctuary, Newcastle has always welcomed people in most need. These people have often made a very positive contribution to our city and have made Newcastle a better place. It must be noted that many Afghans that have worked with us are already good English speakers and have undergone training by UK armed forces, NGOs, and other British organizations. They will be an excellent addition to our homegrown workforce at the time that we are struggling to fill many job vacancies due to the impact of Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, I would like to thank Councillor Ashby for bringing this motion to the Council. And I'm very pleased that Councillor, Councillor Kilgawa from the Labour Group is second in this motion. This shows that when it comes to supporting those in need, Newcastle is always united. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Councillor Ave. Councillor Frew. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and also congratulations to the chair. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Councillor Ashby for bringing this motion, and quite a well put motion. I think it gets to the point effectively. Um, this issue is not just a headline in some faraway country. It has great impacts on people in Newcastle. Uh, there are many Afghans here already who have done great service for our country, for the cause of decency in their own home country, and are now trying to live their own lives. But their families are still largely there. And I've been hearing many stories from dozens of Afghans about their brothers being beaten for trying to protect their sister, who's had the sheer gall to try to get a higher education um, of brothers and sisters bringing their elderly parents away from their homes to hide in rural areas where they don't think they'll be found because the Taliban would be knocking doors and hearing from someone whose father went missing and, well, they fear the worst. These people already live in the constituencies um, I, I know of 30 at least, um, many of whom have served with our armed forces and very strongly have the support of the officers that they helped. And I've seen emails from officers saying that they've emailed in to try and get help, uh, but they don't know if they'll hear back. Um, the government has had months to prepare for this. They've known about the withdrawal. They've known that the Afghanistan government wouldn't hold up and that it wasn't prepared. But they've done nothing to prepare uh, to help families of interpreters of current refugees in the UK to get here. Despite parliamentary questions, despite, despite letters, and we're in the situation now where it's only recently been reported that there are 5,000 unread emails um, from MPs to the Home Office that are just sat there, sitting in a black hole, not being dealt with, because the government simply did not take the issue seriously. Not only are they failing the people who live here now, um, have come from Afghanistan, they're failing our armed forces, they're failing the near 500 soldiers 
who have lost their lives uh, in this conflict from Britain. Um, and they have effectively abandoned peace and security for Afghanistan. And I'm very proud that this council is willing to do better and willing to, and able to do better. It is a shame that our government is not. Uh, and I'd also like to um, thank Councillor Ashby for highlighting the point that it is neighbouring countries that will bear the greatest burden. Um, half of all refugees from Afghanistan are in Pakistan, a quarter in Iran, whereas the UK only has dozen thousand, uh, dozens of thousands in comparison to Germany, which has nearly 150,000 uh, who had a much smaller role in the conflict. And there are fears that there will be another possibly five million refugees from the country. And given that there are a serious lack of safe routes, penalizing people for taking informal routes simply leaves them nowhere to go. And this Arab scheme has been extremely ill-defined, and the schemes going forward we have absolutely no information about. Um, the government has said that they will take 20,000 people in the years to come, which is not much use, uh, especially when they say only 5,000 will be in the next year. Um, and to put that into context, that's still only about 90 people coming to Newcastle. Um, and the situation continues to be dire on the ground. There are 17 million people in Afghanistan facing food insecurity. A quarter of a million displaced internally who are not able to go back to their homes. So I'm very proud that this council stands united in supporting the Afghan people and being decent uh, and being decent global citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Frew. It's on. It's off. It's, it's on. off. Uh, Lord Mayor, it's just to, um, it, the hour is late, uh, and I wish to move the suspension of Standing Order 19 till our completion of the business on the agenda tonight. Okay. Thank you very much, um, and I think you've heard the news, so that's a no, yeah? Can we... Sorry? Oh, we, need to, we need to vote. Sorry? So you've moved that. I assume you've got a seconder. Thank you. That was a no. We need to vote. Can we do that so we could hear this motion complete, please? Sixteen yes, thirty-two no. I'm reading. Um, I'd like to conclude. That will be a no. Can I move on and ask, invite Councillor Doreen Hoddard to speak, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I think we've all been glued to the TV the past couple of weeks while watching what I think has been a foreign policy catastrophe evolving. I've also had to cast my mind back nearly 20 years to when the charity that I worked for decided to set up a project in Afghanistan, very similar to the ones that we'd run in other countries devastated by the effects of conflict. Working with the World Food Programme to enable people feed themselves. And I can tell you it's not very easy to persuade subsistence farmers to grow cabbages and potatoes when the returns from opium are 50 times more attractive. I also remember the early meetings we had with female politicians and staff from other NGOs, especially the professional women, the doctors, the lawyers, etc., who had fled their home countries to practice elsewhere 
and the hope that they all shared that things would improve and that the country would change and be more like the rest of the world and that girls would get an education and grow up to get jobs, etc. It was very promising and it made us all want to help. However, in the past 20 years, the fighting and bloodshed has also gone on. So I do think it's worth reflecting on what's been achieved following the invasion of Afghanistan, whatever the rights and wrongs of that decision. I think everybody has been aware of the rampant corruption, the legacy of the all-consuming theocracy, and the billions of funds and the time and energy thrown into that country. But we can't ignore the massive leap in literacy rates for women as well as men, the vast improvements in health and infant mortality rates, the education of thousands of girls, the numbers of women in the workforce, especially those in the professions and those in public and political life of the country. The influence of democratic procedures, civil and voting rights, which they did not have before, the influence of TV and social media, along with the hope and opportunity for the future that they brought, cannot be ignored, as well as the fact that they are now aware how the rest of the world functions. We may not have set out to rebuild a nation, but there has been tireless work by UN, by charities, as well as the armed forces, and they've had a very positive effect on the lives of those people. And in the past couple of weeks, because I do have some other duties apart from being a counsellor here, I have been on the receiving end of a series of emails and WhatsApp messages with colleagues who have actively worked in senior positions in the Middle East while we were all trying to make sense of the speed of events. And it's hard to believe that it's just over two weeks ago that at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning, I texted a colleague to say, the BBC are reporting that the Taliban are on the outskirts of Tabul. And he said, Doreen, we expect it to fall by 5 p.m. Central European time. Um, and there were tears running down my face because I was thinking of the people I knew who were working there. And I do know of very brave and dedicated people who've been working hard to get trapped people, trapped politicians, women, out from behind their hiding places and into safety. And I've even been sending him messages on WhatsApp and he keeps saying, these are the things of Hollywood. You know, you're watching too many action movies. We can't do it like that. So the, but they're still working to try and get people out. Even a man working for the UN who went back in to work with his colleagues. He got colleagues out, and then he went back in to work with the people. Very dedicated. So I do share the concerns that we may also now be facing a new influx of cheap narcotics and class A drugs, and it remains to be seen if the West is going to be a safer place or if Afghanistan will be a magnet for jihadis. As has already been mentioned, we have already got several Afghani interpreters and their families who've settled here in Newcastle, and I'm sure we will make the next arrivals welcome. At present, we're all waking and watching to see what will happen. And I hope in some small way by donating goods and funds to help the new refugees, we will be confirming that we are a city of sanctuary. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you for listening. Can, thank you, Councillor Hoddard. Can I invite Councillor Ion, please? <laughs> Councillor Ion. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and congratulations to our new Sheriff. Lord Mayor, now that the international presence in Afghanistan has concluded, we are looking at the, one of the worst humanitarian crises 
in the last decade. Desperate Afghan men, women, and children risking their lives to get on board of airplanes, some hanging on the landing gears and eventually falling to their death are just some of the horrific images that will stick to our memories for a very long time. The NATO allies followed the US decision of withdrawing from Afghanistan, relying on unrealistic plans, leaving many foreign workers and Afghan allies without protection for a safe passage out of Afghanistan. The chaos and desperation of the people trying to save their lives, threatened by the new Taliban regime, are a direct consequence of falling, failing of US and NATO allies of creating stable and democratic Afghanistan. Many managed to escape, but many are still left behind not knowing if there will be another day for them. This tragedy should not have happened. I would like to express my condolences to the families of the three Britons killed in the terror attack outside Kabul airport last week. These tragic deaths could have been prevented if the contingency plans were better informed and more realistic. As we speak, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of third party nationals, including British citizens who are still trapped in Afghanistan fearing for their lives. Together with them, there are thousands of Afghans who are supporting international community as interpreters, public servants, human rights activists, and other groups that are seen as traitors in the eyes of the Taliban. The international community has failed them, although they were given assurances that they will not be left behind if the country falls in the Taliban hands. Again, they were wrong to trust their allies. Lord Mayor, we are very proud to be a city of sanctuary, and we will be looking to welcome the refugees uh, from Afghanistan in our city. This task is not simple. Therefore, we call on the UK government to provide the councils with the resources needed to make this task a success. Elzik is amongst the wards with the largest numbers of refugees, and we already are one of the most diverse community where many residents from different backgrounds are calling Elzik and Newcastle their new home. I'm positive that with the support of the agencies and other stakeholders, and with the backing from the UK government, we can turn the sad stories of desperation, fear, and uncertainty into a bright new chapter for uh, our Afghan friends. I would like to end my speech by calling on the UK government and international community to make all the efforts necessary for the UK citizens left behind in Afghanistan to return safely as soon as possible together with the Afghan nationals wishing to leave their country to save their lives threatened by the Taliban. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ion. Can I remind everyone the guillotine has fallen? In fact, the guillotine had fallen. Um, the moment Councillor Hoddard had finished her speech, can I um, invite Councillor Ashby to reply, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you to everybody who has contributed this evening. And we've heard some, some tragic stories. We've heard real life experience. We've heard the way that Newcastle is opening its arms to uh, people in need. It is the, it is the one, one small spark that's come out of this. The other one, perhaps, 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 I'm old enough to remember the, uh, the evacuation of, uh, of Saigon by the Americans at the end of the Vietnam War. At that time, we thought it was a disaster. Over a period of time, with many more lives lost, with many more people suffering, eventually Vietnam turned into a different kind of future. And let us hope, like the thing that was left in Pandora's box, let us hope that the future will not be quite as bleak as we all fear it might be. I thank everybody for your contribution. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor um, uh, Ashby. And it's one of those um, occasions where um, I am immensely proud of this council as your chair. Such moving uh, uh, testaments and speeches that everybody made 
and throughout your speeches, it's quite clear Newcastle is a city of sanctuary, and those um, Afghani people that uh, we do end up receiving here, they will be warmly uh, welcomed. Can I ask, is this motion agreed, or do we need a vote? Agreed. Thank you very much. Now to deal with the rest of the uh, items. Sorry, seeking advice. Um, item uh, 14, protecting uh, public say in the planning process. Um, can I ask uh, the mover do you wish to deal with this tonight or defer it, Councillor Ashby? Uh, well, uh, I would have to accept the amendments, the friendly amendments to be made subsequently. I would have made it my speech, but I have to accept the amendments. Thank you very much. Those of you who couldn't hear on the right hand side, you have heard. Excellent. So uh, the amended motion is now becomes the substantive motion. That, is that agreed? The amended motion was going to be um, uh, moved by Councillor Bell and seconded by Councillor Mendelssohn. Is that right? Yep, thank you very much. It was. Item 15, uh, valuing children. Another motion. Can I ask the mover, Councillor Morrissey, would you like to deal with this tonight or defer it? You, you'd like to withdraw the motion? Thank you very much. Um, understanding order 20, uh, you can. So, okay. Moving on to item 16. Homeless and uh, immigration rules. That's another motion. Can I ask Councillor uh, Hobson if you would like to deal with this tonight or defer it? Deal with it tonight. You were going to move that. It was going to be seconded by Councillor McCarty. Yep, there is no amendment to this. So is this agreed? agreed? It's agreed, thank you. Item 17, rats across the city. Um, Councillor, Councillor Bell, no, Councillor Smith. Have, have we lost all of this notes everywhere? That's right, yes. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, can I ask the mover, Councillor Smith, would you like to deal with this tonight or defer it? Was that? Defer this, okay, thank you. So that's deferred. Final item, item 18, seeking an end to fire and rehire tactics by employee, that's a motion. Uh, to be moved by Councillor McCarty. Councillor McCarty, would you like to deal with it tonight? Yes, there is a, and it w this would be amended, uh, seconded by Councillor Robinson. Is that the case? We've got an amendment uh, to be moved by Councillor Stone and second uh, Councillor Cott. Is that correct? Okay, so is the amendment agreed? No. We need to vote. Can we vote on the amendment first? So on your devices again. Is there anyone who isn't able to access their devices? One, two, three on the right. One, two, three on the left. The three on the left, your vote is? Yes. And on the right, no. Three, three on the right, uh, no, and three on the left, yes. So that total is 
So, yes is 19 and no is 37. So the amendment is voted down. Now we've got a we've got a vote on the motion. Okay. Now to vote the original motion on your devices again. Okay, so I'm reading no is zero, and yes is 46, it's just gone 47. Um, and I do realize there might be one or two who hasn't or isn't able to vote. It's quite conclusive. Uh, thank you very much. Can I come back to uh, the point of order Councillor Smith was raising earlier on um, asking if we would consider uh, to pay our respect to those soldiers and armed forces and certainly the innocent Afghani people uh, who find themselves in such a uh, dire and tough and horrible situation. I need to pose this as a question to the council. Does council agree to hold a minute's silence? Can I ask all to stand for us to observe a minute's silence, please? Thank you very much, Council. I might as well conclude this standing, uh, get some movement done. Uh, the, the next meeting will take place on Wednesday, the 6th of October, 2021. Please, could you, I was going to say remain seated, just remain stood until told otherwise how to move on. Thank you very much. Wish you all good evening, good night. And that concludes tonight's meeting. <laughs>